Well, good morning. We're in the house of God again, and it's the 24th of October, 2021. And we're reading from the end of Luke 10. I'm reading uh, verses 41 and 42. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. It's interesting in life, isn't it, that we get what we want, you know. We really do. And it is a matter of choice. She has chosen that, that good part. That's the title of my talk, that good part. Chosen that. And I've got to say this, and the older I get, the more pronounced it is, to me, the effect of human choice. The number of people that you see, that you know, everything could have been different for them if they'd made different choices. Is that true? I mean, nothing's more true, is it? And, uh, and of course, the ultimate thing, am I going to choose God or self, it's in effect the devil, well, am I going to be like Mary, who wants one thing and, and, and knows that, that only one thing is needful? Or am I going to make other choices? The choice you make will always reflect what you want and what you're prepared to pay. Those two things. And when I say pay, you know, there is a verse, isn't there? Buy the truth and sell it not. You can buy it and you can sell it. Uh, you have to make that decision that when God speaks to me, I will obey him at any cost, whatever it takes, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy that precious thing. Or you can say, well, I do know, but I'm going to do something different. I, I'm going to sell it. I don't want it that much. What do these two sisters want? We've got Mary and Martha, and I'll read into it a little bit earlier, because uh, in verse 38, it came to pass at the end of this certain village, a woman called Martha received him into her house. Actually, there were three there, weren't there? Martha, Mary, and their brother Lazarus. We'll look at that in a moment. Martha, um, she had a sister called Mary, which sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. That Martha was cumbered about and much serving very busy. <clears throat> she came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister's left me to serve alone? She's leaving it all, all on me. Why doesn't she help, you know? Um, make her help me. Bid her, therefore, that she help me. But Jesus sees the real issue, doesn't he? That's the great thing about the Lord. He does see the real issue in our lives, and he, and he, does, he addresses the real issues. Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. And um, what do these sisters want? Mary, in a word, wants life. She wants life. Life. Some people do anything, don't they, to live, to have a life they're going to enjoy, to get fulfillment. It never works. But, you know, there's something far worse, and I really want to talk about this just very briefly. There can be a search in the right place that also will never work. I want to go to John 5, uh, page 1054. Search in the right place, but it's never going to work. So I'm reading verse, in John 5, verse 39. Search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. You want life, like Mary. You're looking in the right place, in a sense, obviously. And they are they which testify of me. They are, they should be, they could be for you. It's essential that they are a means of coming to me, to know me. It's no good knowing all the facts, the doctrinal facts, you know, being very solid in your, your beliefs and not, no errors and all of that, and 
And mind you, I'm not, don't get me wrong, that's a huge issue, it's a huge battle. Talking in the car to a um, dear sister about one gentleman who's got sucked into a cult. And uh, they can explain why Jesus isn't really God and he's got all the scriptures to back it up. And it's actually poisonous. It'll kill him. Because, it, because the aim is not just to find out those doctrines. Here's the point, isn't it? And you will not come to me <clears throat> that you might have life. That's the thing. Coming to Christ. So that's what she's doing. She's, she knows here's a golden opportunity. He's arrived at the house. He's ministering truths kept secret from the foundation of the world, I'm quoting. And Mary says, I want to receive that. I know Martha's looking daggers at me. <clears throat> and maybe I should be helping, but I want something else. One thing is needful. Life. You search the scriptures in them, you think you have eternal life. <clears throat> but you will not come to me. So we are to, at any cost, turn to Christ, aren't we? To come to Christ, to, to relate to him, to get to know him, to open our hearts to him, to give him our time, our devotion. Our energy, because he is where life is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. As I was thinking about life and uh, its value, and I, do you know what came to my mind? That, I don't know if you know that song by Elton John, song for Guy. And I think Guy was a young delivery man who died in a motorbike accident or something, and I might be a bit wrong about my facts, but he sings this song. He builds in very nice, very good music. It's very touching, actually. But um, one line is, life isn't everything. You're wrong, Elton. Life is everything. It is everything. I'm talking about real life. Get back earlier in the chapter. I mean, <clears throat> still in Luke 10. <coughs> frog in my throat. And you, you, you see very dramatically illustrated uh, with this encounter with the disciples coming back. I mean, verse 17. They've come back from a very successful kind of missionary journey around, around Israel. And they are so excited that they've got power in the name of Jesus. We never should be excited about that. We should never desire power in itself. We should only ever want God to have his power exercised through us and we to be just very poor human instruments. That's the limit of it. Um, but he says in verse 17, it says the 70 sent out the 12 two by two, then he sends out 70 more two by two and they minister and they go around the country doing that and they come back and they return with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Well, thank you so much. As lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. I've got to say, I like that verse. <laughs> Let's receive it, friends. If we are really in Christ Jesus, serving him from the heart, in faith, with the Spirit of God, we're invulnerable. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And that is to say, they are written in the book of life. Life. That's what he's saying. And uh, you remember going to Revelation 20, why that is of such importance. I'm not going to say there is, there is nothing that is more important 
than making sure that my name is in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. And um, in verse 12, I'm in Revelation 20, page 1, 2, 3, 3, well, verse 11, I suppose, to set the scene, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face, and it can be, we can't imagine, I didn't say imagine, you can't, we cannot begin to imagine it, but what a scene, from whose faith, face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, death and hell, Hades, that is, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. No wonder, going back to Luke 10, the Lord Jesus says to them, this is a, this is a momentary thing. You are on this earth for a moment. Even if you're a servant of the Lord, as these men were, it's a moment. And if you're a servant of the Lord in his will and purpose, with the Spirit of God, in truth, in, in that commission which God has given us, then certainly he's going to give you the ability to do his work. And you will have authority over these evil things. And you will be invulnerable in a sense. But it's for a moment. Even if you serve God wonderfully, the best Christian servant on earth, and you serve God wonderfully, it's, it's for a moment. And then comes eternity and all that will matter. And he's saying to them, don't be so excited that in this moment, while you're serving me on this earth, for this short time, I've given you an authority to do the work. Don't be so excited about that. Far rather that your names are written in heaven. Because you're going to be in eternity very, very soon. That's true of all of us. Very, very soon. I think of it all the time these days. Far more important that you should have life is another, and it's not anywhere else in Scripture. There's something rather like it in Luke 14, but in Isaiah 14, it's not the same. It makes an extraordinary statement, doesn't he, about the evil one. I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven, shot out of heaven. The second that proud rebellion started, whoosh, His, Satan's life has gone for all eternity and nothing can be done about that. You know, we are talking about very serious things, friends. Eternal things. And isn't it wonderful that humans, although dead in sin, and in a sense, like Satan, fallen sinful creatures who all knew better because we all had a conscience, even if we didn't know the word of God, we can be saved. So is that, isn't that wonderful? We can be saved. And what the atonement of Christ has done, again, it's a pretty common theme of my thinking and speaking, and I guess with all of you, but... We, I don't think we, we will never get over it. We will never um, be able to express from grateful hearts the measure of what God's Son has done. I don't, think in, I don't think in all eternity we will. I really don't think so. You go back to the beginning of Revelation, chapter 1, where you, just to pick that up and look at it in that context, the Revelation context, and page 1218. And um, he's been given that, that marvellous series of messages and visions to give to the seven churches. It's, it is to them, but it's to all of us. Um, verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Wow. 
and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I can't imagine what that wail will be like. Can it? We can't imagine. I've mentioned it before. And we used to have a marvellous Congo missionary, Joe Robinson, and he told us about his prison visits in the Congo. And he said one night there was a man wailing all night long, wailing in an agony of distress. He'd murdered his wife that day. The agony of distress that he would love at any price to not have done that and to have her back and, and it can never be done. It's, do, it's gone forever. That's what that, that wail will be like. Coming up from the human race, God sent his son to die for us and we rejected him and now it's too late and now we see what's coming and nothing can be done. What a wail that will be. Well, he actually can't imagine it, can we? But what about us? Thank God. He has washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he's made us kings and priests unto God, his Father. To, and why, goodness, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. I should think so. Amen. Now, Martha is a good woman. And she wants life too. Let me just say that. And if we go to John 11, page 1064... She's a good woman. Don't, don't ever underestimate that. And, 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 but, it, but there's a very important lesson there, isn't there? She's a good woman. She loves the Lord. She's welcomed him into her house. But she's totally burdened down. And he, because with that issue about him, Mary not helping to cater for the crowd that's there, that was an, a problem in, the, in that moment but it isn't the problem the problem is you are Martha Martha you are burdened and troubled about many things you've got loads of anxieties and cares and it's like in the parable of the sower you remember the weeds that choke off the life of God one of them is cares anxieties it's a killer isn't it anxiety it's a killer and I thank God we won't turn there now to Timothy 1 verse 7, but God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And I reminded the Lord and actually the devil this morning that I have a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And it's, it is the fear that's the problem. Nine times out of ten, the real problem isn't that particular issue that's worrying me. It's the anxiety that it brings that can paralyze us and, and it can take away our judgment about things and we won't even get an answer right, we won't do the right thing, we won't work out what to do because we're driven by that anxiety. And, and we've, got to, we've got to just shed that, friends. It's a, it's a weed that chokes out the life of Christ. It's one of those weeds, the love of money, the love of pleasure, the cares of this life, that choke out that life. The parable of the sower, the third case in the parable of the sower. But she's a good woman. And you look at John 11, where we meet her in her, we almost say in her glory, really, because she's, she obviously took, took serious note of what Christ said to her. Obviously she did. And again, it's always the same, isn't it? Will I listen to God? Will I do what he says? Which always comes back to the very basic things, doesn't it? But you get to verse 20 of John 11, because Lazarus has died. The brother in that family in Bethany, that little family home of those two sisters and that brother, he's died. And then in verse 20, and the Lord, has, he's deliberately not gone there because he wants him to die. So he will raise him from the dead as a mighty demonstration. Not just of his ability to raise the dead, which he can do, obviously, but to, to give... Um, backing to a great principle which we're about to read Martha as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming went and met him Mary sat still in the house interesting isn't it 
Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother had not died. But I know. But even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it thee. You could raise him, I know it. Jesus said to him, your brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know you'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She knew about what we read in Revelation 20, when the dead will all rise. She knew about that. And then we get to the real issue, don't we? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. What about that? We're not going to die. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> we might step out of this tent into the Lord's presence. We're not going to die. She said to him, and this is again, she's really in tune with the Spirit in this dialogue, isn't she? She said, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art that Christ, the Son of God, which had come into the world. Now, when we follow Mary's approach and we, we get the message that one thing is needful, it will take us to every good thing, but I want to mention a couple of things in particular and illustrate them from Luke 2. So we could be turning there, page 1011. What will happen to us if we take Mary's line where we, we push everything aside because we know there's one thing that matters, only one thing, to sit at Jesus' feet and draw from him, we will get to a closeness to God and an ear in tune to the Spirit of God and an awareness that ever increases that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. He is the Saviour of the world who died to redeem mankind. Those things become more and more real to us when we take Mary's line. Of, 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 one thing's needful, that's what I'm going to do. Luke 2. Um, on page <clears throat> 1011, <clears throat> verse 25. And I want to look at Simeon. This is at the birth of Christ, you remember. And verse 25, there was a man, verse 25, there was a man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Can I make this point very firmly? That anybody who pretends to be anointed by the Spirit of God, but isn't just and devout, is a fraud. Okay? If I'm really an anointed Christian, I will live a life that plainly is a holy, I won't say attempt, a holy means of pleasing God. And it's always so. And I, and I uncompromisingly uh, assert that. It was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death before he'd seen the Lord's Christ. What an exciting message that must have been. been hundreds of years since there's been any real prophet in the land and now the Messiah's coming and I'm going to see it it must have been marvellous mustn't it he came by the spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do from after the custom of the law then took him up in his arms and blessed God and said Lord now let it say thy servant depart in peace I can die now I've seen your salvation as a baby, I've seen your salvation. God has arrived in the flesh. I've seen it. I don't suppose he understood it, but he knew that he had seen the Messiah. And you read on, you get another, and this comes out of a life like Mary's where we know there's one thing that matters and we, we pursue that one thing. And uh, there will be a calling on us to seek and to pray God's will into various situations. That will develop in our hearts as we press on with God. It, it has to. 
uh, we will be absolutely motivated to seek God and to pray that his will is done in very many situations and that will be our life and you see this lady verse 36 there was one Anna a prophetess daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of As Asher she was of great age old lady she lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about 84 years. What did she do? She departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she also, because of that, she's in touch. Coming in in that instant, she gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him, that is of the baby Jesus, to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So those things, as we really set ourselves to pursue the one thing needful, those things will develop in our spirits marvellously. A closeness to God, an ear that's in tune with the Holy Ghost, and an ever-increasing consciousness of the real being that Jesus Christ is. That becomes ever-increasingly sure. We were talking earlier with my sister about this poor guy's come out of the new age into Jesus, he thinks, and he's been captured. But as he, may God rescue him, and as he then becomes like Mary, the reality about Christ will become increasingly clear and unshakable. And uh, he too, and all of us, so as, we, as we go down Mary's road, we will be those who pray God's will into existence. Not into existence, but into performance is better. Into existence, badly put. Into performance in all kinds of situations. In our immediate families, in our, in our church, in our acquaintances, in our community, in our nation, in the world. That's what praying does. When God leads us in that way. And I'm so convinced that that kind of praying is going to be our portion here at Stroud Green. And I believe God is going to do something mighty. I'll read my verse to close. In Luke 10. Jesus answered and said to Martha, 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 you are careful and troubled about many things. I think I will just, I must read Philippians 4 very quickly. I didn't plan to, but it hits this nail on the head so hard, doesn't it? In page 1170, <clears throat> be careful, that's anxious about nothing, don't worry about anything. Verse 6. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It's a definition of praying, isn't it? And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Martha, you're troubled about so much. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken from her. Amen. Thank you, Peter.